Good morning and welcome to the walk off, everybody. I'm Scott Belford, joined as always by the best co host in the biz, Adam Mack. And we've already got uh, some stuff going on in the chat. Matt Finley here on YouTube says, Happy seventh year anniversary to the Batista Bat Flip. Do you remember where you watched that game, buddy? Uh, I was in Red Deer, Alberta. Yeah. Uh, I was plumbing at that point in my life. Uh, thankfully, my boss was also a Blue Jays fan, so we were cutting every workday short at 2 p.m. <laughs> it was uh, amazing. So I got to watch that that whole playoff run. It was uh, it was a good time. So yeah, good time. Plumbing clients everywhere around Red Deer were like, I don't know why October is so busy for these guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Why does overtime start at two? I was in Toronto response. when it went down. And That's... I remember I had I had a show that night at Yuck Yucks, and I showed up 10 minutes late to the show, and I never did that. This was before I was actually a professional comic, so, you know, I was still trying to build up my name and so on and so forth. Right. And I just didn't care. I was like, you know what? If they wind up, like, firing me from this, how often do you get to watch this type of game? Anyways, I showed up. I come in in a huff, and the room is empty. Nobody is there. <laughs> Just a bunch of comics who were like, "Oh my God, did you see that home run?" Right? Like, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, playoff baseball. Well, um, some magic from Jordan Alvarez. Of course, we're going to get into that Astros and Mariners series here. Uh, lots of stuff to get to today. Thank you so much to everyone who is joining us. We have been going live a lot more, and we really do appreciate. Everyone who follows along there. I know we weren't doing live because our computer system was such a pain in the butt. And then everyone kind of uh, gave us a lift up there and helped us fundraise the money we needed for this new system. And, and look at us go now. Us go. I can say I, I'm noticing a real difference. You, you yeah. too, obviously. No, it's yeah. great. It's great. <laughs> so let's keep this momentum going. Uh, lots to get to through the off season. Lots of good interviews coming up. I know we've got but three scheduled for next week already. So yes, speaking of great interviews, well put there. This is a great way to to tease this. So Brennan Delaney, he is with Jays Nation and is a writer following the Jays throughout the season, and he is big time connected to the Jays minor league system. So we're having him on on Monday, and we're going to deep dive into all of those guys, the Addison Bargers, the Ricky Tiedemans, some of these new prospects that just kind of appeared on the scene in 2022. So we'll uh, pick his brain on what's going on in the minor league system. Speaking of the minor league system, TJ Brock. Vancouver Canadian. He was the sixth round pick overall, or not overall, sorry, sixth round pick for the Blue Jays this season in 2022. So he uh, just made his jump from college ball to pro ball and finished the season with the Vancouver Canadians. So we're going to have him on the show on Tuesday. And then good friend Jim from Ball Cap Sport hey, is joining us on Wednesday. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. that's right. Of course, we had uh, the one and only Craig Ballard yesterday. He was really uh, uh, informative when it comes to Blue Jays front offices of the past. We kind of got into what this front office has to do and if we have faith in them still. Oh, Craig's in the chat right now. Look at that. Um, so, yeah, great guess. Adam <laughs> and I always say it. Adam and I always say it. We may not be uh, much, but... Boy, oh boy, do we ever hit above our weight when it comes to getting guests. So <laughs> Yes, sir. All right, let's get into this. The Astros put the Mariners on the ropes yesterday as they head to Seattle here for Game 3 of their playoff series. First time a playoff game is being played in Seattle in 21 years. We'll talk Blue Jays. Preserving George Springer has to be a priority. Moving forward, we'll explore how to make that happen. Blue Jays and Maple Leafs comparisons are so abundant right now. It is driving me nuts. They have to stop. I'm going to get into it. This may upset some Maple Leafs fans, but we must stop these comparisons. Right. Uh, friend, friend of the show, hey, call me. And I don't know if everyone saw some of his TikTok videos. They've gone big time viral. He's made some videos about the Seattle Mariners headhunting. And, of course, the crux of some of these videos were the shots the Mariners 
took at Blue Jays. Whether it was intentional or not, we'll get into that. Uh, Yankees and Guardians rained out last night, but they're going to try and get the game. And today we'll touch on that. Adam and I will discuss who would be our free agent choice if we could only pick one to come to the Blue Jays. And then we'll close out things talking. Blake Snell, uh, he's looking to put the Padres up. And that series against the almighty Dodgers, can it happen? We'll give our predictions. Right. Let's get into it, buddy. Your Dan Alvarez is doing some special stuff with that Houston Astros team. Um, two of course, two pretty clutch home game, runs from this guy. Game winning home runs with his team down. First time in MLB history that a guy has hit back to back game winning home runs when down after the sixth. I know that stat is a little bit Mr. Baseball where he's the top doubles hitter in night games right. in August. <laughs> right, right, right. But still an impressive feat. Uh, have you been paying attention to this Astros Mariners series? But obviously we, we both watched the end of, of game of one. And uh, yesterday was incredibly impressive. Yesterday, I had a, a friend's giving. So yesterday was a bit of a shit show for me, but I did catch the highlights. And uh, I was surprised to see the Mariners once again had a lead yes. against the Astros late into the game. Sixth inning, up 2-1. Luis Castillo, man, the dude sure is proving his worth. And that that extension is looking so good now. Yeah. He's a Seattle Mariner for the next five years. They're paying him big money to do so. And if he can stay healthy, I mean, we're seeing glimpses right now of what the man can do in October because he came from the Reds, very little playoff experience. 30 years old, though. The guy has been through the ringer. He's gone through the ups and downs, and I think he's going to settle in nicely into that uh, pitcher-friendly park in Seattle, mm -hmm. right? He's got a fastball that is just mind-blowing, but his secondary stuff just plays off of it so well. I think we're going to be talking Luis Castillo and Cy Young Awards for years to come here if he can stay on the field. Uh, let's talk Jordan Alvarez. I know we were kind of touching on him. You brought up something really interesting from the David Sampson podcast that you were listening to. Yeah, for another show, David Sampson uh, had an interesting point about Jordan Alvarez, used to be an L.A. Dodger. And do you know what they traded Jordan Alvarez for? I actually do. Josh what? Fields. 35-year-old relief pitcher, <laughs> relief pitcher Josh Fields. What an absolute misfire on that trade. Um, but... <laughs> Look, the point of this that David Sampson was getting at was, it, regardless of who your team is, if you want to be hard on management, you want to be hard on ownership for making poor trades or not getting the guy or trading a guy and then watching him succeed somewhere else, even the almighty L.A. Dodgers aren't bulletproof when it comes to making a bad trade or, or getting one wrong. So... Mm -hmm. This is why teams are so trepidatious when it comes to trading prospects for relief pitchers. It always looks back in hindsight. It always looks bad in hindsight. It always looks bad in hindsight. It almost never gives the value you need unless you win the World Series. And we talked about this ad nauseum the last couple of days. You need those big bad bullpen arms to do just that, to win a World Series. So you've got to be prepared to give up some talent to get yourself to the next level. But my goodness, does it ever look ugly when it doesn't work out? And we're talking it right now with Jordan Alvarez. Of course, there is no way for the Dodgers to predict that he would be the behemoth at the plate that he has become. But that said... What could you what could you expect of Josh Fields? Like they were just hoping that 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 move would just push them a little bit closer to the promised land. 
Look, I mean, again, another shot at the Dodgers. They traded Ross Stripling for two players to be named later. Those players turned out to be Ryan Noda and Kendall Williams. Hard to argue the Blue Jays won that trade. Yeah. Or hard to argue they didn't win that trade, exactly. rather. 100%, um, man. So, I don't know. It's just, we're. I know we're in that time of year where everyone is really ragging on Ross Atkins and his inability to make moves and, you know, just pining over the days of Alex Anthopoulos. But, Mm -hmm. like, it's going to get tiresome pretty quick. So It sure will. Uh, You had a point, too, about you couldn't find the tweet, but uh, about the Dodgers. The the Dodgers, when when they uh, did the interview with the general manager, just recently of the Dodgers from 2016. The name even escapes me, which is frustrating. Uh, it's funny. I re- I'm so busy on baseball Twitter. I'm always reading all these stats, and then you know one will stick, and then I'll go back to try and find it, and I can't find it. But anyways, along the lines of uh, he actually thought Jordan Alvarez was a different dude, lower in the system. He was, I forget the first name of the pitcher, but it was another Alvarez. So he didn't even know exactly who was going. And that's the thing with these affiliates, right? You have 200 plus dudes in your minor league system. Some of them are placeholders, especially in that low A and high A levels. So if you, if you just have a guy who's a year into your system and he's technically he's got that asterisk is like you know pay attention to him but he's basically filling a spot so that the real prospects can can get their practice in right yeah you know it's funny it's It's interesting it's funny okay here's a stupid side note that uh just in the importance of like checking who you're actually trading or trading for uh in my fantasy football league, this is like six or seven years ago now, but there was a trade involving Rob Gronkowski, uh, best tight end in the league, New England Patriots at the time. Uh, the trade was processed. It went through, and then it was discovered that they were not trading for Rob Gronkowski of the New England Patriots. They were trading for his brother, Glenn Gronkowski of the New England Patriots. They just saw Gronkowski Patriots saw this is a great deal and clicked accept only to find out they had like the backup running back (laughs) on the practice squad. Glenn Uh, Gronkowski who had no value at all, but uh, that is too funny. I love that. I love that. Uh, Connor in chat, of course, Connor, friend of the show here. He's got a very great uh, Blue Jays podcast if you're watching and uh, haven't watched the flight deck. I suggest you do so. But Connor brings up, he's like, I will never forget that the Padres in two separate trades gave up Ty France, Matt Brash, Andre Munoz, Cal Quantrill, Josh Naylor, Austin Hedges for Nola and Clevenger. And that's the thing with pitching, man. You can overpay for it and most likely are going to. And there is a reason why we watch the Blue Jays be tentative at the trade deadline. And I've come out and said a million times that I would have loved to have seen them do more at this trade deadline. I'm not defending them at all. But there are plenty of examples of teams overpaying for pitching. In fact, probably more examples of that than it actually working out. So just another little caveat for folks in the... uh, Screaming at the front office to do something. Sometimes it's just not that easy. Uh, what did Rose the, Charf, uh, what did the Yankees end up? chat says, okay. call it the Kikuchi effect. Sorry, Adam, go ahead there, bud. Uh, I was just wondering, what did the Yankees end up paying to get Frankie Montes? Three high-end prospects, bud. Three high-end prospects. Uh, he pitched, what, six or seven games? Not yeah. well at the end of the season and he's not on their playoff roster for this round. So who knows? Will it work out next next year for them next season? Maybe, That's, maybe they not. They got to cross their fingers and hope that they get Frank, Frankie Montes of of past performances back. That's truly <laughs> Actually, uh Craig Ballard on one of his TikToks was pointing out the bullpen options that were traded. Um 
I don't have them right now, but if Craig's still here, maybe he can let us know. But the two bullpen arms that the Blue Jays saw success with and Anthony Bass and uh, Pop seemed to work out quite well. Uh, some of the other options, I know Josh Hader actually has turned it around now in uh, San Diego. Mm-hmm. So, But you just have, you never know. You never know. Trades are finicky. Trades are finicky. So let's flip what we're talking about here to the Blue Jays. Um, I think one of the priorities for next season, and Adam, feel free to jump in here if you'd like, but I really do believe one of the top priorities for this Blue Jays organization moving forward has to be getting George Springer into more games. And I think the best way to do that is getting him out of center field. So he's six, three, he is one of the taller center fielders in baseball currently. And for the most part, I I was reading really interesting stat. Most guys after about over the height of six, two, uh, move to the corners by about the age of 31, 32. There are not many guys. There are not many guys who stay in center field when they're a big-bodied dude just because it's such a high-impact position, right? We watched Vernon Wells do it in Toronto. He moved to right field when he was about 31. We've seen guys throughout Major League Baseball make that move when they're a big-bodied fielder, and this is one thing that the Toronto Blue Jays truly do need to address. Here's some stats on George Springer, okay? We all know he played most of this season banged up. Mm -hmm. In his first two seasons with this Blue Jays team, Springer started 204 of 324 possible games. So that's a 63% rate. 124 of those 324 games, so about a third, were in center field. 78 at DH, two in right field. And if you look at those 204 appearances, how many of those was he playing hurt in? Yeah, I bet not you, exactly 100%. I bet you another sure. half. I bet you another half. So we've seen in 324 possible appearances from George Springer in the last two years, we've seen him appear in about 100 of them healthy. That is a problem. That is a problem, and I think that this organization's number one goal should be to up that to his 75% rate that he is healthy and in the lineup. So how do you do that? Well, you take him out of the highest impact position in baseball, which is center field. You move him to right field. So that means the Toronto Blue Jays would then need a center fielder, correct? I'm following your math. Yeah, it it checks out, Scott. So what I did was I kind of combed through all of the possibilities at center field, whether through free agency or through a trade, and I have compiled a bit of a list here. Uh, By the way, there are some candidates in this list that are incredibly unlikely. Guys like Cedric Mullins guys like Byron Buxton that most likely aren't going to go anywhere, but I added them to the list if I felt there was even a sliver of a chance that teams would possibly listen. On sure, it. sure. So let's start with free agency. Brandon Nemo, formerly a New York Met. Okay. Lefty bat. Lefty bat. High on base percentage. The guy is an on base machine. He's going to cost some money. He's going to get paid. Yeah. He's going to need some term. So you're going to need to commit to him. My guess is a four year contract. But he is an excellent option at center field. And he does fix. Some of the problems with the handedness in this batting order. And I know, listen, I'm not even saying that lefty bat is the most necessary thing on the planet, especially if it's not a high-end bat, right? We can we can pepper this lineup with Rymel Tapia's all day long, and that's not <laughs> yeah. necessarily the answer to the handedness problem. But a guy like Brandon Nemo definitely does help. 
The next guy on the list I have is Byron Buxton. Listen, I've heard nothing out of Minnesota that they're even considering moving on him. But, but there is a reason to think they might consider it, and that is if they truly believe he might not be able to stay on the field. Which, if that is the case, you know dang well that anyone who is inquiring about him is also going to have that concern. They may also decide that that six-year, $90 million remaining on his contract is better spent elsewhere. Byron Buxton, super low chance of coming to the Jays, but that is an option to explore. The Blue Jays front office have worked with the Minnesota Twins front office in the past. Of course, he came. Uh, they just brought in Jose Barrios last year at the trade deadline from the Minnesota Twins, so there is a relationship there. Cedric Mullins. This is another very small chance that it happens, number one, because even if he was truly on the trade market, it's very unlikely the Baltimore Orioles are going to make a deal within the division. That said, Cedric Mullins, 28 years old, three years of ARB remaining, and the reason why he would fit so well on the Jays, right? Switch hitter, adds that speed at the top of the lineup, and he's not quite as redundant as some of the bats currently in this blue jays order yes he does have some power but he also sprays the ball all over the field and gets on base he would look really good in a blue jays uniform and why would the baltimore orioles even consider moving him well we're well aware of how deep that prospect pool is with the orioles and colton Kowser is a top five prospect in their system he plays center field he also hits left and they need a place for him coming next year. He's already pushing point. that major league roster pretty heavily. The next one is interesting because it's it would be an interesting and creative trade that made this happen. Cody Bellinger with the Los Angeles Dodgers. He's a UFA in 2024. Now, he's an expensive candidate. He is ARB eligible this year. He's probably going to make 15 to $16 million. And he, for whatever reason, has regressed at the plate to an almost brutal level. You know, he's just above that 200 batting average. 210 this year. He was 165 last year. He has struggled. So of course, but go ahead. MVP in 2019. Yes, he was. Gold Glove, three Silver Slugger, ago. hit 305 with an OPS of 1035 in 2019. So he is expensive, but if the Dodgers eat his salary, eat some of his salary, anyways, or take on a salary coming back the other way, you say Kikuchi looking your way then maybe you can just put him in the nine hole in this lineup. Tell him play a great defense, which he does. He's an incredible center fielder. Yeah. And just hope that maybe he finds it at the back end of this Blue Jays batting order. Now we're getting into candidates that are, are far more likely. Okay. And, and guys that I would really want to see this front office target and go after. Uh, I've got Mike Yastrzemski from... The San Francisco Giants Okay, down here. Now, he plays right field the majority of the time, but he does play a proficient center fielder. He's a free agent in 2026, so he comes with some term. He's got a career OPS uh, plus of 114, so he's above average at the plate. He's a left-handed hitter. Again, this is a guy who's probably going to hit 8th or ninth. Yep. In the in the batting order, this isn't a dude who's going to slot into that number two hole or anything like that. But he is a very good defense first and left-handed hitting option with term. Something that this Blue Jays organization should be looking for. But if you want to go the other route, and let's say you want to go um, the bargain route, if you will, Kevin Kiermeyer course enemy number one with the blue jays for years on that tampa bay yeah. rays team a stalwart of the rays and knows their system inside and out he is going to be a free agent this offseason now obviously a lot of miles on this odometer but he is going to be low cost mm -hmm. don't know exactly his health status but man he can play a mean center field when he is healthy and as a low cost flyer 
to compete for a bench spot, I'm all for it. Gets rid of Bradley Zimmer, right? Kevin Kiermeyer can come in off the bench. Like we're just looking, we're looking for ways to get Springer into right field. And with the fact that Whit Merrifield can play some center field, and then if you bring in a guy like Kiermeyer, it does give you more options off of the bench. By the way, I'm not advocating for any of these. I just these are options that I think would legitimately work if you're looking, um. If you're looking to to move Springer to right, Scotty Scott's got here hilarious, and he's like, he's already familiar with our scouting reports. Hey! <laughs> of course, we remember him grabbing Alejandro Kirk's cheat sheet as he slid into home there. So, yeah. Uh, so now we're getting into the guys that I, I really would like. Okay, Dalton Varsho is like my number one target. He's with the Arizona. Diamondbacks. He's manning center field there. He's a UFA free agent in 2027. He's going to be expensive in a trade. This is this is a guy that, yeah, you probably watch Kirk or Moreno go the other way. But, man, the dude is a defensive stud. Great, drum, uh, great jumps, great roots, great acceleration. He goes and gets it. Elite fielder, lefty bat. Let's dig a little deeper into his stats here, Adam, if we will. Dalton Varsho. Yep. Uh, looks like last year, or I guess this year with the, the Diamondbacks, 27 home runs. Impressive. Yep. Uh, 235 batting average, OPS 745. Stolen bases, 16. It's got some speed. The next candidate that I have here um, would mean Ross Atkins picks up the phone and calls former Blue Jay front office component if you will ben sherrington now the general manager in pittsburgh and you see what brian reynolds is up to he's got two years of arbitration left on his contract he makes a lot of sense because the pittsburgh pirates are so shit that getting a uh, getting getting a prospect like gabriel moreno could really work for them so if you're going to play from that area of strength with the blue jays and they're looking for a young catching stud gabriel moreno fits that ilk very well maybe you can go in there and get david bednar you know uh, uh speed a velo first reliever something that lacks in this Blue Jays bullpen, David Bednar would look great in a Blue Jays uniform. So you want to do a you want to do a combo trade, get both of them. Yes, Ryan Reynolds to help us in the outfielder is a switch hitter. Add David Bednar, left-handed pitcher as well. <laughs> I know this is a thorough uh, combing through of center fielders. The last one I have written down here was mentioned by Shai Davidi in the article that he wrote a couple days ago where he just kind of brought up the fact that with Yaddy Molina retiring this year mm -hmm. with the cards, they are in need of a catcher. And, of course, any team with a catching need is going to get brought up this season in rumors with the Blue Jays because the Blue Jays have a strength of catcher. So Lars Newtbar plays center field. He's got a left-handed bat as well. He's got speed. Speed. He is controllable. All of the things that this front office for the Blue Jays would be looking at. Adam, of course, has the stats up there for you watching on YouTube. I don't know who I particularly want the most. Varsho is probably number one on my list, followed by Reynolds. And then after that, whatever this front office can kind of figure out I'm all on board, but I do think it's incredibly important to see George Springer in right field next year. I think it's going to extend his career, and I think it's going to make sure that the DH spot is a little bit more available. Because that's that's the thing, right? Like when you when you go over the numbers of Springer and you look at the 204 appearances that he's made and only 124 of those are in the outfield of 324 possible appearances. Man, that's a lot of shifting Rymel Tapia into center field. Way more than I would want to see. Yeah, I mean... Look at the value that 
Bryce Harper was still able to contribute to that Phillies team playing what is exclusively DH too strong of a word. Yeah. Not necessarily, not quite exclusively, but almost entirely this season. Truly. Yeah. Um, Started the year, obviously, in the uh, the outfield, suffered a couple injuries, and they just figured, you know what, we can keep him in the lineup if we keep him out of right field. Um, they're giving a lot of money to Bryce Harper now to be a DH. Yes, so hopefully DH. in the offseason he can get, get healthy and get back in the outfield. But for George Springer, what do we have, four years left on his contract? Four years left on his contract. The next two years are going to be in because the next two years he's still going to be able to contribute mightily to this team i'm not saying the last two years of this contract are a write-off but i think the last two years you just got to deal with the fact he probably is a full-time dh and so you've got to start reorganizing this lineup now looking Mm -hmm. forward to that right like roster construction has been a point of contention on this show and many others for the last two years and now is the time to start fixing that construction. Did you have anything else to add on the center field talk? No. Um, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, George Springer needs to be a three quarters of the time DH slash right fielder and maybe put him in center on occasion. But yeah. I want to. the thing is. If you can address the two problems of a lefty bat lacking, I know Simon Dennis says, so who is the lefty bat for the top of the order that's going to break up all of our righties? And there are options in there that do work out, right? A guy like Newt Bar does work to break up those righty bats at the top of the order. Varsho does work at the top of that order. Brian Reynolds does work to break that up at the top of the order. So there are options there, of course, when you start shopping. I mean, the thing is, a guy like Cody Bellinger or Kevin Kiermeyer is going to be a low-cost acquisition. I hope that this front office is exploring all of the options, and I think they obviously will. But even getting a guy like Kevin Kiermeyer, who is going to be a better option than Bradley Zimmer, improves this team. Look, here's okay, here's one thing to keep in mind, too, is that this offseason is going to come down to more than one move. We did our Carlos Correa video yesterday with Carlos Correa uh, opting out of his contract officially. Um, I don't remember who the comment was from, but we did get a comment from someone critical of the idea of bringing in Carlos Correa. You know, it it doesn't solve our lefty bat problem. It doesn't solve our our bullpen issues. It doesn't help with our, our starting rotation. But like... Same thing with moving George out of center field. Like there isn't one single move that's going to solve all four problems that we have. So no. this is going to be a multiple move off season catchers. That abundance there needs to be addressed. Like it all, it's going to take probably four or five medium to large transactions this off season to fix all of these holes. And I think there's going to be some creative solutions too. Like you mentioned uh, with the pirates there. Right, mm-hmm. taking a couple pieces in a trade. There's going to be a move that solves one problem that opens up a new hole that also needs to be solved. Right, so yeah, and, and Warloo twenty two brings it up there. Like Cody Bellinger, legit could be a solution in center field, especially if the Dodgers are prepared to take a little bit of money back, and maybe they would, right? Maybe uh, two years at 10 million of Yusei Kikuchi is more valuable to them than one year at 16 million of Cody Bellinger. I don't know how they are going to look at their um, their payroll and, and if they need to shed any money. I mean, the Dodgers are the Dodgers, they're behemoths. Cody Bellinger be for Teoscar Hernandez straight across. What do you think? <laughs> I don't like it. I think <laughs> Teo is such a better bat, but I mean, we do need to figure out center field. So we'll see what, what happens here. Uh, Matt Finley is uh, uh, 
asking a question here. He says, do you think Bo has a down year if he is moved to second base? He seems like he is determined to be a major league shortstop and he could get soured up. What do you think, Adam? Do you think a move, a position move, do you think uh, Bo Bichette's a big, a big boy and can handle being moved to second? Um, I Another think... question for you, Adam, while we're talking Bo okay. Bichette. Do you think moving him to second might actually increase his offense if he's not so concerned about his defensive prowess? Uh, I mean, that's a great question, too. It, it, the glove does seem to be tied to the bat psychologically it's a factor right like when you're struggling in one facet of the game it in fact affects everything look Bobachet could be proud to be a shortstop one of the toughest positions to play in all of sports or he could be like one of the best second basemen to ever play the game you know mm-hmm. we watched the shift with Vladdy over from third base to first, did not, you know, he wanted to be a, a third baseman. He settled in nicely at first base. Look at the power increase He's for Marcus it. Simeon when he was moved to second base. I don't know. I I think Bo Bichette can play shortstop. I, I think, think so too. I think he would be, if we could get a better shortstop, whether it's he a Dan B. Swanson or a yeah. Carlos Correa, or a whoever, it increases their entire middle infield by moving him to second base. Like, he would be a much better second baseman than Kevin Biggio or Santiago Espinal or Whit Merrifield. So if that is the option to upgrading this team, I would much rather see them go out, get a improvement at shortstop through free agency, and move him over, rather than go out and find a better second baseman. I agree with that. And I don't necessarily think that moving Bo should be a priority like moving Springer is. But I do think if there is an opportunity to improve the team at shortstop, it should be legitimately considered this year more so than the 2022 offseason. Agreed. Or the 2020 George offseason. needs to move out of center field. George Bo doesn't need leave to. center field. Yes. All right. Let's move on. Uh, I do want to talk about all of these Maple Leaf and Blue Jays comparisons being made. I'm well aware I lived in Toronto for six years. I get Toronto fans and that they like to connect all of the dots. But will you Leafs fans just get your stink off of the Blue Jays? (laughs) This has nothing to do with the Maple Leafs. Stop dragging that Maple Leafs curse into baseball it has nothing to do with the toronto blue jays they're completely different teams if i've got to see another freaking meme where it's spider-man with a blue jays <laughs> logo on his face and the maple leafs with a maple leaf uniform or uh logo i just you know listen i'm well aware of the strife of the toronto maple leafs everyone in canada is there's a ton of pressure on them to win totally different scenario gang totally different scenario nhl is a salary cap world there is no cap in baseball and it is a soft cap it's not the same by any means making the playoffs in baseball is so much more difficult than it is in hockey being eliminated in the first round is different than it is in hockey and just because this core is also young and the Leafs core is young, I I, I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Much bigger sample size, too, with the Leafs uh, flunking their way out of the playoffs. Uh, we got a comment from Aaron on one of our videos, and Aaron listed the eliminations from the Maple Leafs uh, dating back to 2016. <laughs> Every single... I mean, it's just... It's a much yeah. deeper uh, issue with that core than it is with ours. Do I want to see them turn this around, though? You bet. I don't want to see a third year. Like, No. I am worried. I am nervous about this. Of course, and I think most Jays fans should be. 
this is a massive offseason for this Toronto Blue Jays organization. Yeah, it is a... I, th I think it might be the... it. This is literally for this core and this window moving forward, this offseason is the most important offseason of this Blue Jays front office. Yeah, it is... Uh... There's no more leeway. There isn't. Because the moves that he makes, Atkins we're talking, of course, this offseason, is going to decide whether this team wins or lose. They've built the core. They've got the kids coming up through the minor league system. They've got the layers of talent that they talked about right from the beginning. They gave their timeline, and it's pretty on par with what they said. You know, they wanted to make the playoffs in 2020. I don't really count that 2020 playoffs because they eight teams per league made it. It was kind of a weird one. But, uh, oh, great, awesome. All the sex sites are now spamming us here. Awesome. Uh, yeah, but, you know, this, this front office is, has got to get it right, and there's some mega, mega – decisions how, to be how long here. has atkins been at the helm of this team now seven years 2016 so whatever the exact numbers is on the math there but six years for the first three or four years i was an atkins believer mm -hmm. i trusted the process me too we had the hope and the excitement of the the kids were coming the kids are here now and now for the last two full years, I've been an Atkins apologist. I will own that title. I've made excuses for him. Yes. I have touted the good moves. I have defended him against the comparisons with Alex Anthopoulos, the apples to oranges comparison there. There was... Trade deadline issues... This year, again, I apologized, made excuses for, you know, expanded playoffs and the market was different than anticipated. And, you know, we spent so much of our prospect capital to get Jose Barrios and, and everything like this. But now I'm to the point where I'm kind of done apologizing and believe like now it's time to put up or shut up, put Ross. up or shut up. Like, let's get it done at this point. You know, we, I can't think of another excuse that could make me apologize for him next year. You know, like, okay, we've seen that the, the trade market with the expanded playoffs is different than it has been in years past. Mm -hmm. We have to have learned from that. We have to go out and make the big trades in the this off season. The year. We need to go spend cash money in the off season. Like, because when I Carlos go from Correa apologist. signs with the Baltimore Orioles, Scott, that AL yeah. East isn't going to get any easier. Hey, Balan I go from more balanced schedule or not. I go from apologist to calling for his head next off season if if we don't see some some major improvements. I'm right there with you. I don't think we can see any regression uh, from this team. I don't think ALCS are bust, buddy. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, if the Blue Jays miss the playoffs, Atkins has to go. Whether he's Shapiro's even, guy or not, I, I think even Shapiro is. I and I think listen. Look at what Alex Anthopoulos did with his back against the wall. So maybe a little bit of extra pressure is going to be good for Atkins. We'll see what happens here. I know that uh, Rosencharf in chat says, Atkins didn't sound like trading a whole lot to me in the interview the other day. Of course, that press conference where he kind of did the unpacking of the season with the press in Toronto a couple days ago. And he did straight up say, that uh, he's not looking to move any pieces from the core. That said, and Adam and I have talked about this, what do you expect the guy to say, right? He's not going to show his cards. It's just bad business to do that when it comes to leverage with other teams. It's just a bad idea to come up and be forthright in that sort of scenario. Yeah. So I don't think we actually, I think we should all expect a big move. I think it is going to happen. We'll see. Uh, I know Andrew M in chat says Bo better defensively than Santiago at second question mark. Not sure about that. Well, I will address that because that was my comment was that Bo would be a better second baseman 
than Santiago Espinal. Uh, first of all, I think the upside defensively with Bo Bichette at second base is there. Mm-hmm. But I will also categorize it by saying this. Even if it's not, there's still the offensive side of the ball that is a factor. So yeah, he might be not quite as good defensively at second base, but he would be substantially better offensively. And yes. <clears throat> the net value there of having Bo at second base. Yeah. Santiago second had baseman. an incredible season. I love Espy. Big Espy fan. Great first half. I don't think that he is in the plans moving forward personally. We'll see. Look, Espinal is a, a a great guy to have on a like you can't just have everybody be making twenty million dollars a year. No. <laughs> right? So you need to supplement your roster with guys like Espinal. But that does not mean Espinal is going to be Espinal for this team forever. <laughs> Those guys can be added in other like Espinal. Ugh, I feel bad. I feel like I'm crapping on Espinal now, but no, I I'm I feel like Espinal is awesome. He's a great bench guy, right? Like he's he's a dude I would like to see if he stays with this team, kept as a utility guy. However, he may hold value to a team like the Pirates, like. The Diamondbacks, right? A team that is in a tough division, that is in a bit of a rebuild mode, and just needs a solid major league player to play second base, which is what Espinal is. Is Espinal going to win any batting titles? No. Is he going to be a defensive black hole? Absolutely not. He's very solid defensively. We'll see what happens with him. But I don't think by any means he's an untouchable. And if a team comes knocking for Santiago Espinal and there is um, someone coming back that's addressing a need this Jays team has, I think he's gone. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I could definitely see him being gone this offseason. All right, buddy. Uh, let's let's move on here and wrap up things. Okay. Uh, we're we're getting long in the tooth here. Uh, Yankees and Guardians rained out last night. They are playing today in just a few minutes. Actually, where are you feeling? Uh, where are you at on this Cleveland Guardians team? Do you think that they can win a game, or do you think the Yankees are going to <laughs> sweep them right out of the playoffs? Are they going to put up a fight? I think they will. I think I sure hope so, man. What's that series at right now? One nothing still. One nothing for the Yankees. Everyone in chat, feel free to pipe up here if you think that uh, the Guardians have a chance here. I I would sure love to see them push the Yankees to five games. It would be nice to see the Yankees sweat a little. So what's the pitching matchup for today? We got Nestor Cortez versus who's pitching for the Guardians. Bieber? Yes. Yeah, Bieber can steal a game for the Guardians. Right? Oh, for sure. Look, N- Nestor Cortez is probably one of the more reliable pitchers for the Yankees, but I could see this Guardians team taking one, two, one again, like they did against the, the Rays in the first round, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, if the Rays, if the Guardians could take one in New York here and then go back to Cleveland... I, I totally think there could be an upset coming. Why not? That would sure be nice, buddy. I, ju- I just want to see this series competitive, you know? Yeah, no, I just want to see the Guardians win three straight from here. Well, yeah, wanna... me too. I would I would <laughs> I love to, yes. Put the boots to it. Go Guardians. Go yeah, we'll Guardians. need to wait and see how that plays out. Of course, Blake Snell having a rebound season here. He's taken the, the ball for the Padres here looking to defeat the mighty Dodgers. Of course, that series is tied at one. Yeah. The Padres definitely putting up a fight here uh, as they bring the series back to San Diego. Blake Snell's resurrection, if you will. Do you have his numbers up here? I do. You want his season numbers? Yeah, like, let's take a look at his season numbers, but then also if we can kind of go over. Uh, so last he pitched. So uh, let's 
looks like. 128 innings this year. ERA of 3.38. Good, not great. Uh, whip of 1.203. Uh, strikeouts per nine, 12. Walks per nine, three and a half. Yeah, his strikeups are up it's again. Good. So last year's strikeouts were 4.8. Or sorry, his walks per nine were 4.8. This year, he shaved a whole number off of that, 3.6. Strikeouts per nine up slightly from 11.9 to 12. Um, let's look at his game logs for the latter half of the year. So he got blown up against the Dodgers on September 10th, which is not good. But then in his last four starts of the year, two owned Two earned runs over four starts. So 25 innings pitched, two earned runs. Very nice. And he's really heated up going into this playoff run. Yeah. I know you were, uh, I was listening to. Opponent batting ball. average over his last four games, sorry, 118. Wow. ERA of 072. Wow. Yeah, he's like. Found it. I, I know uh, they were doing a press conference with some of the Padres players, and all of them, obviously, of course, what are they going to say? But all of them were like, if they had to pick a guy for this game, Blake Snell is the dude. The team is really rallying behind him. Who knows? This could be some magic in the air for this Padres team. I mean, all of uh, all of baseball are saying that the Dodgers are going to win. I have a tough time betting against them. I know that I kind of picked the Dodgers to come out of this series, but uh, go Padres. <laughs> hey, anytime you can win one on the road, and they did that, you've got a shot, right? So they took one 100%. in L.A. Now it's back to San Diego for two. So, yeah, it's not crazy to think the Padres could uh, make it out of this round, Scott. Okay, so a big thank you to everyone who has followed along on the YouTube chat. We really appreciate all the interaction, everybody. Thanks for joining Adam and I. We are going to wrap things up here and close the show on both Adam and I giving our free agent choice. If we could only pick one free agent for this Toronto Blue Jays team to score, who would it be? Adam, why don't you kick things off here for us? Trevor Bauer. Just kidding. <laughs> um, nobody saw that one coming. Um, <sighs> this is probably not a sexy name that is going to ever happen, but maybe it's a sexy name. I don't know. This is a long shot. I don't think this is realistic. But left-handed pitcher, uh, 34 years old, Clayton Kershaw. I like it. I like the idea of going out and getting an experienced guy at totally. the back end of that rotation. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious Clayton Kershaw is most likely staying with the Dodgers. And if he he'll does, be a he Dodger might, for he life might at even this retire. point. Exactly. Exactly. But that that's a great choice. Uh, I am going to go with a bullpen ad here. Of course, um, he became famous because of the Tommy Trumpet intro. But Edwin Diaz, I think, would fit really well at the back end of this Blue Jays bullpen. One thing that we nice. talked about yesterday with Craig Ballard on the show was just how little money this Blue Jays team has invested into their bullpen. Last year's bullpen, not including Yusei Kikuchi, was for $15 million. Now, if you, if you count Yusei Kikuchi then it's $31 million. But let's <laughs> let's not count Yusei Kikuchi, okay? So $15 million. I would love to see this Toronto Blue Jays bullpen be a $30 million bullpen. And Edwin Edwin Diaz would do It'll that. Nice. You're going to need to pay him. But I think that one of the things that has lacked on this Toronto Blue Jays team for years is that big, bad, trusted, well-paid Pen arm, the Liam Hendricks, if you will, of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, I would love to see the Jays go out and get Edwin Diaz. So you're down on Jordan Romano or you just. No, I just think that uh, the back you know, end of the pen with Diaz and Romano. would. You be know what this deadly. is? This is the bullpen equivalent of signing Carlos Correa. This is not being down on Boba Shett. No, but. This just makes the bullpen better 
you slot Jordan so Romano into the number eight slot. Great setup, man. Maybe the best setup man in the league if Jordan yeah. Romano is your number eight. I mean, look back on that 92-93 team, right? Like when yep. Dwayne Ward came out in the eighth and then Tom Hankey was still sitting in the bullpen waiting to close out the game. Like that's a pretty scary one too. And I would love no to kidding. see that with Romano and Diaz. Uh, do I think it'll happen? Probably not. This <laughs> front office has shown many times they don't like to spend money on the bullpen, but we'll see. Very good. Let's wrap it up there, Scott. Appreciate Let's do it. it. Yeah, thanks to everyone who has followed along. We really appreciate it. If you're still watching for whatever reason at this point and you have yet to hit like and subscribe, we really appreciate it. If you do, you can follow us on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast, on Twitter, at Walk Off Podcast. You can always join the Discord, all sorts of uh, rabid Jays fans talking baseball and Blue Jays in there. The link is in the show notes. A big shout out to everyone on our Patreon list. We really appreciate you and the buck a week that you throw our way. It really does go a long way to help with our costs. Um, Adam, do you have the list of Patreon here? We can quickly yeah, run down. You bet. Patreon.com slash the walk off podcast. Big shout out to all of our Patreon supporters. Uh, I fumbled it, Scott. I don't have the list ready. <laughs> I thought I could have it. I was wrong. Hold on. Wait for it. I uh, fucking suck. Apologies to our Patreon subscribers. I don't have the list ready. <laughs> this is uh, this is embarrassing. We appreciate you. Yeah, appreciate you, uh, Kyle, Joey, Patrick, Wyatt, John, Dunedin, Bob, Abraham, Michael, Sarah, John, Rashid, Joshua, Jeremy, and Ian. We got there. I found it. We did it. This we part is it. getting cut off when we put it up on the audio side. I'll tell you that for free. All right, everybody. Have a good day. We'll see you on Sunday for Long Toss. Cheers. Cheers.